Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Father. Well, after that first reading, on the day of judgment, I do not want to stand before God and have him say that you failed to warn my people. Because recall in that first reading that God holds us partially responsible for someone's separation from God if we fail to warn people placed in our charge that they are walking the path of spiritual death. We are to be heralds of the way that leads to life. That is, he who is the way, the truth, and the life, right? So after all, wanting our loved ones to be walking the path to eternal life should not only be God's desire, but if we truly love them, it should be our greatest desire for them to walk that path of eternal happiness, not just the way of passing pleasures and the honor of this world. And so God has placed us in people's life in the life of our loved ones so that we can be his instruments that help lead them to that way of eternal life, to be their watchmen, as the first reading put it, to watch over them and have their back as we all journey to our destiny of union with God. And if we fail to do that, what happens? We place our own soul in peril, according to that first reading. So naturally, I don't want to be placing my own soul in peril, especially as a priest, uh, who is a watchman of sorts for you all, and as a spiritual father of the people of God in this, the Mother Church of Jackson. And so, as one of your watchmen, with Father Brian being another, let me make this warning abundantly clear that if we as a society continue to walk down the path that we are walking down, the path of spiritual death, we will perish. If we do not repent, and if we continue down this godless path, we will perish and see the downfall of this great country. If we continue to do away with our heritage as a nation under God and spurn him from the future of our land, then we will perish and it will become every man for himself. Right? There is no higher authority than ourselves in that situation, our fallen selves. And so there will be no objective pursuit of truth and of what's right and wrong, but simply whatever the whims of the ruling party is, where there is no vision for the common good, but only might makes right. See, that's the importance of having God as the foundation of our society. A godless country is a country on its way for something else to be seen as God. And in a world where its might makes right, that's most likely going to be the state that takes the place of God, which is what we see in communist countries, where Christians and other groups who dare to differ with the state are persecuted and even killed. I mean, just look at some of the countries, China, Nigeria, right? We already see political movements in our own country that not only want to remove God from the public square, but even destroy the nuclear family. If that fundamental cell of society is unhealthy or obliterated, then of course the rest of society will be unhealthy. In today's second reading, uh, St. Paul mentioned a number of the Ten Commandments that relate specifically to our conduct with the rest of the human family. Are we following them? You know, St. Paul mentioned the fifth commandment, you shall not kill. Then he mentioned the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. He then mentioned the seventh commandment, you shall not steal. And finally, he mentioned that ninth and tenth commandment, you shall not covet. Right? All of these, uh, St. Paul says, can be summed up in Jesus' commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Have we as a society been following these bedrock commandments necessary for the flourishing of the human family? The answer is pretty obvious. We as a society are breaking all of these commandments in spades, right? And we're doing so without shame. Let's begin with those last two of those Ten Commandments, the sin of coveting. What does it mean to covet? 
To covet is to desire that which does not belong to us, but to another. And the sin of coveting, always desiring what belongs to other people, it's poisonous, absolutely poisonous to attaining happiness. Why, why is coveting so bad and the enemy of happiness? Because so very essential to happiness is a deep sense of gratitude. So if we're always coveting other people's relationships and possessions, we lose awareness of our own relationships and possessions and thus can never be deeply grateful for what we do have. In other words, if we're always fixated or obsessed on what other people have, we will fail to realize and enjoy the blessings of the things and the people that are present in our lives. And then everybody feels unappreciated and, every, and then that's how relationships are destroyed, right? And there is something that happened in 2006 uh, that has now made coveting a daily part of so many people's lives. Uh, can you guess what happened in 2006 that exponentially increased coveting? In 2006, Facebook was launched to the general public. All right, hopefully you can see the connection. For all the wonderful things that social media does in making life more convenient and keeping us connected with family and friends, it has been the absolute worst with regards to placing people in the occasion of the sin of coveting. Now, there are many people who use social media well, so I'm not saying it can't be a good thing. It most certainly can be a good thing. In fact, we're live streaming this holy mass via Facebook as we speak. But having said that, social media has also occasioned countless people spending countless hours coveting other people's lives instead of living their own to the fullest. I know I've spent way too much time on it myself. And so no wonder so many people are depressed. The time we're meant to spend living, we spent coveting. And coveting can then lead to breaking the seventh commandment. You shall not steal. The desire for something that does not belong to us, to us if that goes unchecked by our God-given sense of what's right and wrong, our conscience, that desire can lead us to an unjust act against another human being of actually taking from another what does not belong to us. We've seen this commandment thrown out the window in all this rioting and looting that we're witnessing in the news, right? And we're not talking about going to the grocery store and stealing food and other essentials that actually can be legally had through the Department of Human Services and food banks and many other charities, like the over 4,300 conferences of the St. Vincent de Paul Society that serve every city across the country. By the way, I want to applaud our, our St. Vincent de Paul uh, conference and all of you that support it by providing food and other necessities to people in need. So in this seventh commandment actually refers to the kind of stealing which is born not out of starvation, but out of coveting and out of having that sense of entitlement that thinks those things that are not theirs are owed to them. All right? So I think I'll just go take it. So this sense of entitlement contributes to lacking a profound sense of gratitude. Why? Well, think of the, the types of things for which you are most grateful. There are usually two kinds of things that we appreciate most, right? Things for which we have worked hard to attain. We've really worked at it, and uh, we, care, we take care of those things, don't we? And number two, things that, have a deep, uh, that we have a deep sense that we do not deserve or realize that we could never attain on our own but are nonetheless freely given to us. Eternal salvation being the first and foremost of those gifts. But if we proudly think that we're in, already entitled to those things, then we'll never be truly and fully grateful for them. Right? In fact, I'll just go ahead and take those things even if they don't belong to me. Or I'll have the state take it from them and give it to me. This is sadly the kind of mentality we're beginning to see being pushed by some. Uh, 
these communist-like movements that the church has denounced in her teaching. So having a sense of entitlement robs us of happiness, which is part of the reason why someone could actually have a lot of possessions and yet totally not be happy because he or she lacks a profound sense of gratitude. I'm entitled to them, and, and what well, only thing will make me happy is wanting more. And we can even think this way about heaven, that we are entitled to heaven just as long as we're not Hitler or somebody like that, right? Even when St. Paul reminds us that all have fallen short of the glory of God, each and every one of us. It's solely by God's gratuitous gift and the sacrifice of himself on the cross that we can enjoy eternal happiness of life with him. That that should invoke from us not entitlement, but a profound sense of gratitude. Yet another reason why we need God. And so, now working back to the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. This has been happening, we know, since time immemorial, but again, the internet has been used to facilitate unfathomably more instances of sex outside marriage than we could have ever imagined. Right? Fueled by a pornographic world, we are committing adulterous acts that are destroying marriages and families and has resulted in trafficking and enslaving our youth to suffer the most deplorable acts. If we look back and judge another era, we have not fully realized the hell that millions of particularly women and children are going through this very day. But this total disregard for one another in the human family has been culminating then to where we are now as a nation. This is what happens when we disregard God. We then begin to disregard one another who are made in the image and sacred likeness of God. We've been disregarding God for a long time now, and thus we've likewise been disregarding the human person for a long time now, at least a few decades, several decades, uh, since the sexual revolution, right? At least. Uh, to the point we're seeing the violation of the fifth commandment, you shall not kill. We're now killing one another both in the streets and exponentially more so in the womb, right? Which, yes, thank you, which... Uh, should be, that should be the safest place in the world for a human being to be. But since 1973, it has become the, one of the most dangerous. But that decision has repercussions way beyond abortion. Because as St. Mother Teresa says, whose feast day we celebrated just yesterday, that's why we have her image up here. If we accept that a mother can kill even her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill one another? We can't. If we as a society accept that the life of the most innocent among us can just be snuffed out. As I said in the beginning, we as a society are breaking all of these commandments in spades. And we're doing so without shame. So we need to repent and return to heeding God's commandments. But there is no chance of returning to God's commandments unless there is an even more fundamental return to God himself. Are we still blind then to the utter need for the work of evangelization, the work of the church? Pope Paul VI says the church exists to evangelize. We don't see, sense its urgency until we see the times that are before us that lack even normal civility. And by evangelization, we're not talking about just words because words fall empty these days when everyone's breaking the Eighth Commandment as well. You shall not bear false witness. Right? Everyone's lying to each other so much so that there's just as much falsity as there is truth out in the world. But, and, and so our work of evangelization must be centered about, around living the good news, first and foremost, so that people don't just hear that there is this other way to live than the societal chaos that surround us, but they see 
in us, the disciples of Jesus Christ, that better and much more beautiful way to live. In other words, we need, the world needs saints, right? Which is something each and every one of us is called to be. That's our destiny. There are no non-saints in heaven. If you want to be in heaven, you can choose not to be with God for all eternity. But there are no non-saints in heaven. It'll happen either now or in purgatory. But if we wait until purgatory, then we, would ha we will have failed in fulfilling our God-given mission on earth. Let's be saints now. The powerful effect of God transforming our lives, I just witnessed this past week. I received faculties from the bishop to confirm a woman advanced in age, 90 years old, and not doing so well. Add to that this whole lockdown, there was no way for her to go through the normal route of becoming Catholic. So I got to go to her assisted living facility and celebrate four sacraments with her all at once. They would not allow any other family members in to celebrate uh, this awesome experience with her, just me. But it was awesome. Uh, after she received confirmation, she raised her hands and cried out, Hallelujah! If I could get up and dance, I would. And, and you know what did it for her? It was the witness of her daughter. It was seeing her transformed life through the years, a transformation that would be inexplicable given the checkered past of their relationship as mother and daughter and the incredibly painful crosses her daughter had to carry. A transformation inexplicable, that is, were it not for the person of Jesus Christ and his power working in her life. Her mother saw for herself how her Catholic faith has worked in her life, in her ability to forgive, in the ability for joy, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of her peace. It was like night and day before she came, God came into her life. All right? How about your life? Would your relatives be able to say the same, that they would not be able to credit it to anything else but the power of God working powerfully in your life? Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to be released in your life to have that kind of effect? You and I are called by Jesus to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, not just individually, but collectively as members of Christ's one body. We are to live that just, just society in this local family of God that we want in the society at large. but it takes a power beyond ourselves to do that, a power that we were never meant to be separated from in the first place. So how do we tap into that power? I want to return to the saint whose memorial we celebrate this weekend again, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She and her sisters were disciples in whose lives we saw the good news of Jesus Christ lived out. And that's what gave such power to her words. And so how did Mother Teresa and her sisters tap in to that power beyond themselves, it all began on their knees, right? I saw it for myself as I spent a couple of days in Calcutta on pilgrimage during this mission to India. We were at pilgrimage to her tomb and just getting a taste for, for life as a missionary of charity, witnessed that they began each day with a couple hours of prayer uh, before the exposed blessed sacrament uh, in adoration and celebrating Holy Mass early in the morning, very early in the morning, uh, when nobody else was up. And that was when there was this divine silence, right? What was going on during that time of prayer? I'll conclude with this. I'll let Mother Teresa explain with her own words. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. Right? What's the first element? Silence. You see why this is, the church calls this the, the Eucharist, the source and summit of Christian life because it's here in our worship that we can bear the fruit of faith which can move mountains.
But there first has to be that silence. Is there silence in your life by which God can speak to your heart? If not, I'd suggest you sign up at least an hour a week over at the Adoration Chapel and get that guaranteed time with the Lord of silence so you can hear him. And tonight we're starting a novena of rosaries, a rosary novena that leads up to the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, which is on the 15th. So we'll have the rosary going on nightly at 9 p.m. via Facebook Live uh, from tonight to uh, the eve, which is the 14th. And allow that, just because there's, there's words going out, sometimes that silences our, our act, super active mind to be able to enter in, right? So the silence meaning the disposition of our soul both here at Mass, at Rosary, and whenever we have utter silence. So the fruit of that faith that can move mountains, the, the fruit of that is that love of our neighbor as ourselves, given to us by the power of Jesus. And the fruit of that love is serving them. And the fruit of that service to them, brothers and sisters, is peace.